Well, hello everybody. Apologies for the delayed start. Um, I'm Julia Martin from the Australian Research Data Commons and welcome to today's webinar on FAMES Mobile, a customizable electronic notebook. We are very fortunate to have presenting Associate Professor Sean Ross and Dr. Brian Bolson Stanton from Macquarie University. Sean is also the Director of Data Science and eResearch at Macquarie. Now, this webinar will provide an introduction to FAMES mobile features, architecture and multidisciplinary use cases. You will also hear about the future of FAMES, possible direction for development and opportunities for collaboration. Now that's enough from me, so over to you Sean and Brian. Hi there. Uh, so what I thought I'd do, I'm going to keep this presentation as short as I can uh, so that there's plenty of time for questions and then I can go into more depth about uh, about whatever is of interest to the audience. Uh, but I thought it would be good to start with an overview. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of history of the project. That's something I can I can talk about if anybody's interested. Uh, but I thought that what I would uh, do is start with a little bit of the broader context uh, for for FAMES that that uh, helps to explain the approach that we take and maybe situate FAMES in um, uh, in the broader uh, sort of in, in the broader schema of information infrastructure. Um, so. We work in disciplines, so FAMES, is, FAMES Mobile is software for field data capture, uh, especially human-mediated field data capture, and uh, it's used across a lot of disciplines in, in that, and that's something I'll talk about a little bit more later, the range of the disciplines. But it did start in archaeology, and uh, we started with a big stock-taking uh, um, uh, workshop uh, where we had about 40 archaeologists and it revealed some things that now you know now that I've done more research into uh, in, into information infrastructures are pretty typical of uh, small data research um, uh, one thing you know it's, uh, small data like big data is all, has been the flavor of the month for the last few years right and uh, somehow people think that if data is smaller that it's easier uh, but uh, small data is a term of art that's used by um, uh, Christine Borgman and others to uh, to describe the kind of data that emerges from communities where um, you know where yes the size of the data may not be uh, you know in total as as large as some of the big data disciplines like astronomy or genomics or whatever um, but it has other uh, difficult aspects of it uh, and one of those is, is uh, that that proved um, quite important for us was uh, a a lack of, of of standards or agreement on how you know what data should be collected how it should be collected these sorts of things. When we started the project, we thought that we would make a, you know, handful of pretty of static data loggers uh, for different kinds of archaeological activities, a couple of kinds of excavation, a couple of kinds of, sur uh, of surface survey, uh, artifacts, a few other things. But we got reactions like this that uh, um, uh, that essentially showed us that no one was going to agree on anything, and so we changed to a far more generalized uh, uh, approach. So this uh this challenge you know was probably our uh, you know was the leading one a relative lack of standards but that goes along with a number of other uh, aspects uh, that that are that are common of small data small science long tail research uh, the the a number of terms are used in the literature so our communities are smaller they're smaller scale um Diversity uh, is uh, one of the key features of it. The, the questions, approaches, methods, uh, the data, uh, heterogeneous data, um, variety of content, ranges of structure. Um, another thing, again, that Borgman has really found in her ethnographies of, uh, of, of, of um, field data capture in ecology is that the data the structures that are used, the infrastructure are, are, are they they're they're emergent. They grow out of uh, of the field work that we do. Uh, they grow out of the um, uh, the research questions that we that we ask, uh, and so it requires a certain amount of flexibility. 
Um, and uh, I've already spoken about the lack of standards uh, in in many, if not uh, if not all of our disciplines. There's a relative lack of um, uh, or, or a limit limits to infrastructure and funding that um, uh, some of our colleagues in uh, you know in bigger data disciplines seem to do better with. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of a couple of conversations I've had with uh, with structural geologists complaining about the uh, seismologists and how they get all the money. But uh, uh, anyway, the um, uh, but something that is coming for us is that uh, we will soon have all of these problems of diversity, heterogeneity, limited resources, lack of standards, et cetera, if from the you know small data, uh, small science side of things, small data side of things. Um, but we are also starting to get larger and larger data sets from our field work, from things like various kinds of geophysical remote sensing, photogrammetry, um, other, uh, other approaches. So this combination made for a challenging um, context for the development of FAMES. The other piece of context that I would mention is that if we think about the research data lifecycle from uh, from planning and designing through cap collect and capture, you know, th uh, on through analysis to eventually uh, um, archiving and publication of uh, of data. Um, the data capture, the area that we're working in, is probably the least mature uh, for the for our disciplines. Many of our, not all, but many of our disciplines have had domain-specific repositories for some time. There are some very well-established uh, uh, repositories in archaeology, in ecology, and other in other fieldwork disciplines. Um, but then, as you move closer to the origin of the data the creation of the data uh things get uh, you know a little bit less they get less and less mature so you know yeah when 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 it comes to processing an analysis uh, a lot of that is still done at the level of the project um you know at, you know with some virtual labs or science gateways in some of our disciplines uh, so that's sort of a middle level of maturity and then finally at the at the you know, at the coal phase where we're actually capturing the data, this is where it's the most most varied. Um, uh, uh, you know, even within our disciplines, uh, the it, within any of the individual disciplines in the in the in in uh, field sciences, there's uh, quite a bit of, of variation, and we found that even in archaeology when we uh, uh, you know when we started. Also, the, the 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 working conditions are often difficult in network degraded or offline environments. Um, you know, and, uh, and and harsh environments for the uh, uh, for the equipment. Um, so the uh, the other thing that uh, came up has come up is that um, you know a lot of the commercial solutions that are available they weren't really designed for what we do, and they may not be sufficient for what we do. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation did. Did a, a fairly extensive stock taking a couple of years ago of existing commercial solutions, and uh, as as context for or background for um, for going out and um, uh, and uh, sponsoring a prize competition uh, for for the design of field data capture um, uh, software, and uh, their uh, their stock taking that they did uh, came to the conclusion that the commercial solutions aren't uh, um, aren't entirely satisfactory. Uh, there's also the problem with commercial solutions, and we face this in archaeology. That about you know 10, 12 years ago, a lot of effort was put into, uh, and the direction that field data capture and archaeology went in was in was in the Esri ecosystem, and then they changed their business model, business plan somewhat, and and it really made it sort of impossible for us to use their their software so we you know in our discipline at least we've been burned once by this and uh, you know and and are a little bit cautious about uh, relying on um, on commercial solutions where research will only ever will only ever be uh, a, a small slice of what they uh, what they do so that's enough about uh, about uh, context I will go through you know what you know where we're at with Fames now. What Fames Mobile, the current uh, software that we have, does. It's Fames Mobile version 2.6 that we're up to uh, right now. Um, 
software that we've been developing since 2012 uh, and uh, uh, where we plan to go with that in the future. And again, I think I'm going to start with a, a bit of the broader approach that we take and then I'll drill down into some of the features. And I know some of you may be most interested in, well, what does it do and what are the features? And then, and I, I, I'm happy to go into uh, more depth uh, about that um, you know, uh, afterwards in the Q&A if I don't cover it enough now. So um, a, few, you know, a few of the principles of, uh, of our approach. Uh, one is that we're, we're research specific. We design, you know, uh, we, we're, we're designed for you know, field data capture in a research environment, whether it's academic research, research done by uh, consultancies, heritage or ecological or geotechnical consultancies, uh, or, or by other research uh, uh, organizations. And we developed a lot of specific tools that uh, uh, that, that support um, some of the things that are necessary for us. And there's just a couple of examples here, um, you know, with uh, mobile GIS and some other things doing, and in this case, picture dictionaries to improve data, you know, data quality. Um, another one is that we are generalized in the sense that um, Fames Mobile isn't a data logger that you you know that you can you know make a few extensions to. It's a fundamentally customizable system. Uh, Brian can talk more uh, in the Q and A. Brian can talk more about the the specific approach we took. But the short version is that we have let's call it core software that is an interpreter. And uh, it, you know it does a lot of the heavy lifting with synchronization, mobile GIS, data you know, uh, structured and multi you know structured data management, multimedia data management, these these sorts of things, um, version control, other um, uh, other uh, hard things. Um, but for you to use it, you have to make your own customization, and we call those modules. And essentially, what you do is create a um, a customization file that you that the interpreter reads and then instantiates your customization at uh, you know w when you run the software on your mobile device so it's deeply customizable that way and uh, if you go to the fames project github uh, uh, repository you will see Oh, I think we must be up around 50 different customizations now that uh, uh, that we've uh, that we've done with uh, with Fames, and um, and you can interrogate those those files if you want. And an interesting side effect of this is that those files that define your data schema and your uh, and your UI, your your user interface, which uh, your your workflow um, essentially, uh, those files. Uh, they're more or less human readable. They're XML files, uh, and uh, they they really capture the essence of a project. They capture. They, I think that they're they they are uh, actually const that they constitute some really important metadata about a project. Uh, in that they you know if you look at it, you can see the data structures, the workflows of that um, project. So I think that they they've got an important uh, sort of open open research, open science sort of uh, aspect um, to them them in and of themselves. So another thing that we did uh, was, um, in addition to being deeply research specific, deeply customizable, um, is that uh, uh, we're we took a federated approach that Fames Mobile doesn't try to do everything. It, it we tried to be very good at one stage of the uh, of the data lifecycle at field data capture, and then we hand off to other uh, you know to other software. Um, you know, I know other projects have sliced this pie differently and try to provide end-to-end uh, -end solutions within a narrower domain, and that's that that's fine. Um, you know, that's a a valid approach. But I mean, we found that um, the the needs requirements. Um, of projects across fieldwork disciplines, whether it's in archaeology, geoscience, ecology, oral history, ethnography, you know, the, the 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 needs and requirements are pretty similar. And if we solve generally enough for a you know for a discipline like archaeology, you know, and we could have started in any of these disciplines, I think. But if you, you know, if you solve broadly for one of these disciplines, the solution is transferable to the uh, to the others, especially taking the generalized approach that we've done. So 
Um, so far as well, our uh, you know our software is uh, open source. So we think that this is important for open science uh, you know reasons, open scholarship reasons. Uh, the for the core code is um, uh, is on GitHub GPL uh, v3, and uh, the the modules which are is the code for customization is also open uh, under some. I think they're mostly under Creative Commons li licenses, and it's all on GitHub. Um, I will say that I think that this is important for open for open scholarship reasons. I will admit that we have never had any external um, people parties uh, contribute to our core code base. We have had people independently um, take existing customizations from GitHub and tweak them for their own, uh, you know, projects. Uh, most projects came to us to, you know, get us to, uh, and hired us on a consulting basis to, or wrote us into grants or, you know, otherwise uh, remunerated us uh, to, um, uh, to do their customizations for them. Um, but uh, but we have had a handful of projects run with it themselves, and we did hire a technical writer at one point, uh, funded by a small Nectar grant, to uh, uh, produce a user to developer guide to ease that uh, transition. Um, something that I um, this approach of being generalized and then doing these customizations, I would say the one real advantage of it in our disciplines, where you know as is common of small data disciplines, we uh, we have limited resources. The cost of doing any given customization is, you know, depending on the complexity of your customization is going to be between $1,500 and $15,000, say, uh, if you hired us to do it for you, depending on its complexity. Uh, I don't think we've ever had one that was uh, more than about 15,000 for the customization unless the project needed us to uh, um, add uh, um, a ca a capacity to the core software. And for that, you get a piece of software that it would probably cost you 150 to 200, you know, call it $150,000 to, um, to build from scratch if you went out and hired an Android or iOS uh, developer to do it. So, um, you know, we're, we're working on a paper now that looks at, at at the total cost of the whole project, uh, including the you know the ARC grant we won, the Nectar grant we've won, other funding that we've won, the uh, and and adds that all up, and then um, uh, divides it amongst all of the customizations that we did, and we still come out uh, much you know less expensive uh, for deployment on any given project than a uh, than a bespoke. Uh, mobile solution would uh, would cost. So that's a little bit about our general uh, approach to things. Uh, what I would do, what I'll do now is, and you've already heard me mention some of these, but I will run through. Well, you can see the list here of uh, some of the key features for Fames Mobile uh, that I think I think that this combination really distinguishes us from uh, any of the existing. Uh, uh, I'd say even commercial or um, you know or open source um, uh, um, alternatives to to fames. Uh, so some of the things that I'd point out are I've already talked through the fundamentally customizable approach that we have. The other thing that we do that uh, other uh, that that uh, not much other software can do as well, I think, is um, tightly bond that capture and tightly tightly bind uh, a, a range of different types of data and this again is to to speak to that heterogeneity diversity of the kind of research that we do it, that we can handle geospatial multimedia free text tabular data uh, in you know uh, data from uh, captured from instruments uh, or external uh, devices we can handle that range of data and bind it tightly uh, to one another and get it and really leverage that binding in the sense that we can do things like when you export your data, we can read your records and rename all of your photographs by, you know, uh, uh, based on the data that's in the record. Uh, so it could have, you know, the location you're working, the date, the time, whatever, you know, whatever you want. And we can bulk rename all, all the multimedia associated um, with, a, uh, with a project that way. Um, the other thing, so, 
that's a, the other the next thing that I'd really put is that was quite challenging at the time uh, to develop is that everything works offline and it works offline in a very robust way. We don't just cache data to a local you know on your local device. We have a copy of the entire data store on your uh, uh, on your local device. Um, and uh, this combined with bi-directional synchronization that the devices opportunistically when they are online, when they do hit a network, uh, uh, they uh, synchronize with the server and then all the other devices connected to that project will synchronize as well. So it's bi-directional synchronization uh, opportunistically and you can, because the entire data store is copied to every device, you can lose the server and lose nine out of 10 devices. If you've got one device, you'll have all your data. It's quite um, uh, robust uh, that way. Um, so uh, um, uh, this and, and again, this works opportunistically and the uh, application is agnostic, whether your server is local sitting in, you know, sitting in your room attached to a uh, to a uh, uh, a vehicle, um, whatever it can, it can be local or it can be an online server. Um, we keep uh, we use an append only data store so nothing is ever actually uh, deleted or changed uh, that and that provides us with uh, a complete record history includes versioning rollback uh, etc and again uh, um, speaks to the way that we've we've really prioritized the um, uh, you know the the uh, preservation of all the data that you capture uh, we developed uh, a, a, a pretty full, fully featured mobile GIS. Um, I will say this is something where people said, our researchers at our stock taking said they were going to use this a lot and it has been somewhat underutilized. I'm not sure I would spend quite as much money on our mobile GIS next time as I did last time. Uh, but we do have, we have layer management, vector graph, you know, uh, 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 vector mapping rasters. We can we can handle all of the basic stuff that you'd expect in a uh, in a GIS. Um, connect to internal and external sensors um, blue, via Bluetooth or or, or USB. Um, the difficulty of that just varies by what type of sensor it is. Um, we are multilingual. We use pretty standard uh, localization, internationalization approaches. That uh, I mean, we have our, our we're we've we've had deployments in uh, in in Bulgaria, in China, um, in Malawi, uh, in South America that all utilized having uh, two or three uh, languages that you could swap between in the application. Um, and uh, one of the, some of the things that we do to really help improved data quality is that we deliver very granular help and this can be a text or images uh, it's html essentially uh, that when you're in a specific field you can hit an info button and get uh, instructions about what you should how you should record whatever you're recording uh, we had one large archaeological project at lake mungo run by latrobe university uh, university nikki stern down there uh, that took about a 400 page field manual and chopped it up into little pieces and uh, and attached each you know uh, a set of instructions with pictures um, to uh, uh, you know to the specific field that it was related to um, and at the same time uh, with uh, that we um, uh, uh, we can also capture quite granular metadata uh, that there's a notes field attached to uh, to every single field in the uh, you know in the application and you can kind of consider this the margins of your notebook uh, when you're uh, out or the margins of your form when you're out in the field so you can you can get very very granular uh, metadata or um, you know uh, problems that you've run into or anything like that captured uh, uh, captured uh, in in the records and we also do something uh, else where uh, when we're when you're making observations that are dependent on a person sometimes you want to indicate uncertainty and every field can have an uncertainty indicate indicator um, fine uh, the last couple of things very quickly um, generalized export uh, if you give us a target uh, Brian may uh, may complain about this if you give us a target Brian can probably uh, write you an exporter to uh, hit that uh, that target and out of the box uh, fames comes with um, CSV export and um, uh, shapefile export and we've done a number of JSON exporters as well uh, so um, we can uh, we can 
we were designed to be part of a federated, loosely coupled uh, system. Uh, and the last thing is we have put throughout our system some hooks to help make data more interoperable. Things like any place where you've got a controlled vocabulary, uh, you know, um, check boxes or drop down or anything like that. Uh, in the definition uh, documents, in the definition file that you use for your customization, you can specify a URI that will connect that to, will point that at an ontology or, or thesaurus or shared vocabulary online. Um, the, one of the more common uses for this is that uh, if, you, if, you've, if you've got planter animal species, you could put the URI for the Encyclopedia of Life in or something like that. So. Um, we do a number of, of data interoperability uh, uh, features uh, to, to um, uh, help make our data sets more compatible it, with, but using a, you, you could, doing it this way, you can do it with quite a light touch and do most of it in the background in a way that allows researchers to, to do the research they, the way that they want to, use their own local terminology, but then map that to to shared vocabularies or ontologies. Um, I have a number of testimonials here. I'll let you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a minute to read a couple of them, uh, but I've already gone a little longer talking that I would, uh, than I'd planned. And I wanna give you a quick preview of what, we're, what we've got, uh, um, what we're planning for the future. So I'll let you read that one maybe. And what's a, uh, The top one here is pretty good from a large project in Malawi, or archaeological project in Malawi. And uh, the uh, Syro Mineral Resources uh, Unit in Western Australia has used FAMES extensively and seems to be pretty happy with us. So one of the things that 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 uh, the team in mineral resources uh, told, uh, uh, you know has let us know is just how much money they saved in helicopter time because of the increased efficiency of uh, field data capture. So just to quickly wrap things up so that there's plenty of time for questions. So where are we at now? We've been developing FAMES since uh, FAMES Mobile since 2012. We've, uh, you know, we have mature, it's mature, stable software. We're very well aware of its sort of limitations, uh, but it's nearing the, and its strengths, but it's nearing the end of its useful life. Uh, more and more of our stack is going, uh, is, is, is going out of, it's um, no longer supported. And uh, we, we really can't keep it going the way that it is now. So, uh, two years ago, we developed a high level technical plan for a version, uh, you know, a, a hypothetical version three, and we won that. Uh, uh, we were one of seven um, plans that were selected uh, if, uh, in that um, uh, challenge.gov, innocentive.org uh, um, uh, um, uh, ch uh, challenge competition. Uh, a couple of years ago that was sponsored by the Bureau of Reclamation. And the idea was that was going to go to a, a second round then. Uh, and we were one of seven chosen out of about 160 or 170 plan uh, you know, proposals, uh, but then leadership changed at the, at the Bureau and, it, uh, and nothing ever happened with that, but we've got a plan. Um, one of the things we've been struggling with grant funding, uh, as many infrastructure projects do, and we've come to the conclusion that we've got that anything that we do in the future has got to be uh, commercializable, uh, and uh, and it needs to be commercializable as a, a self-service platform. In that we have run an open source consultancy around existing fames um, for for several years, and that brought in a certain amount of revenue, but it's not really scalable. Uh, so we we want to move to more of a, a, a self-service model. Um, and to meet that in, we, we've gone through uh, Cyro's on-prime program. I'm going to the on-tribe event this 
uh, next week in Melbourne, we, we're uh, taking advantage of the resources that they provide. And the most important thing that came out of that is as part of that program, I don't know how familiar everyone is with it, but um, the centerpiece of the program is doing interviews with existing and potential clients. And we did over 70 interviews to give us an idea of how responsive our software uh, is to actual client requirements. And I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, we are considering uh, applying for an ARDC platforms and services grant with um, the same team that put up, we, we put up three LEAF applications uh, with about half a million dollars of co-investment from universities and from uh, from CSIRO, uh, from the Mineral Resources Unit. And um, the last one with the Heritage Consultancy as well. And unfortunately, none of those three were successful. Uh, so we've given up on, on LEAFs. We did have a LEAF in 2014, but we've given up on them since then. Uh, so we, but we are considering the ARDC platforms and services call that's out right now, but only if we can reconcile it with commercialization. And I have a phone call with them tomorrow to discuss whether that's possible or not. And we are running into a challenge that Brian and I and the rest of the team are very um, committed to open research and to open source software, but um, uh, convincing anyone that any open source software business models are viable is proving very difficult. So. The things that we must do technically, and this is based on the 70 interviews that we did uh, to, uh, improve, to uh, uh, improve uptake, and this is what's on our, our, our plans now, is the first thing was right now we did native, our current version, we did native Android development and we got to do cross-platform. Um, it, you know, somewhat to my surprise, it was really a deal breaker for a lot of people that they couldn't, you know, run it on their iPhones. So uh, we got to go cross-platform. Um, the other major thing when we ask people, why did you go use some of our commercial uh, competitors instead of us or try to use them at least, um, uh, they said, well, some of your competitors gave us a graphic user interface based web, you know, uh, a web application where we could play with it ourselves without, you know, having to code any XML to, you know, do a customization. So we've made that a high priority to uh, uh, to allow self customization uh, via a web application. Um, we're also looking at improving, um, uh, you know, the orchestration of deployment to uh, infrastructure, whether it's AWS or other uh, other infrastructure, while also keeping the option open to have a, a local offline server. Um, data round trip to external desktop or online software. This is basically the idea that you go out into the field, you collect a bunch of data, you get back to your base, you synchronize with the server uh, or you synchronize one way or another. And um, then you want to open the data that you've collected that day in ArcGIS or QGIS or whatever, uh, do a bunch of editing to that, uh, that data and then have the edited updated data available in the field the next day where it can be edited again. Um, and right now we can't we can't do that. We can uh, we can visualize uh, legacy data, but we we don't have that round trip. And that's something that our users and potential clients uh, really want. Um, We'd be moving to a more modern uh, architecture with an API that would allow access to the data that way. Right now we use uh, ETLs, uh, we use um, transformations on export to hit a target that we, we want, but we don't have an API. Uh, and we've got a number of technical improvements we wanna do that, that uh, um, improve scalability as in terms of performance on the on the uh, on the devices synchronization uh, the ability to really scale a project up and have multiple servers and have them synchronize with one another um, and do some and then finally do some user management security one of the trade-offs we found with uh, having a generalized system is that it is difficult to keep the performance up but we believe that with the improvements in technology over the um, uh, over the last uh, you know, eight, nine, eight, you know, seven, eight years that that is much more possible now than it was um, uh, than it was when we designed the existing system. So that's really what I had. I've provided uh, for you a list of our existing uh, publications, which include a, uh, a, you know, a technical paper, a software publication of our existing system. Um, 
and uh, which also include some discussion of socio-technical uh, obstacles to reuse. And uh, we've got some case studies, if I can find it. Uh, the uh, measure, uh, measure twice, cut once is uh, uh, three case studies. Um, so uh, these publications are available. Uh, this presentation uh, is uh, available on uh, uh, you know on GitHub, and here's the uh, GitHub for uh, uh, for Fames as well. And um, that's really what I had to had to present. And at least I've left a while, uh, you know a, a little bit of time for questions. Hi, Brian. Did you want to take over from here? So I think at this point, we'll, we'll be better served by answering audience questions. I'm happy to provide technical answers to folks, but I'd, I'd rather not go into technical detail about things that people don't care about. Uh, so if, if chat can, sorry, if our audience can put questions into chat, Sean and I will try to answer them. I've actually um, got a question from the outset. It's not probably more social than technical. You've got such a diverse range of workflows and a growing library in the GitHub files. Is there a community that you're developing around Fames? I mean, we are uh, we are trying to develop uh, a community, and a lot, and it does tend to break down more by discipline uh, in the sense that we you know that, that our archaeologists will share with you know with one another and uh, you know the the oral historians and ethnographers will share with with one another um, and we have had cases where uh, projects you know unaffiliated unrelated to us they'll just eventually send us an email with either a question or to say hey we used your software where they've picked it up and run with it themselves um, you know, uh, when we still had funding, uh, we we used to, you know, uh, when we had grant funding, uh, we would run workshops and bring users together and do things like that. We haven't had the luxury of being able to do that recently. All right, thank you. Now, we do have a, a question here asking, is there any comparison with REDCap? Uh, REDCap, I... I don't I, I don't think that's a direct comparison. There is an entire sort of um, not just Redcap but other software that was designed for social surveys, right? And look, I my familiarity with Redcap is uh, not very deep. Uh, I, I, I've I've had to learn a little bit more about it recently because there's been some uptake at Macquarie, and I've I've somehow become the administrator of the system here, but uh, uh, I'm relatively new to it. Uh, but there's a there are a number of pieces of software. Redcap, I would say, is one of them, and um, another one is the whole everything around ODK, Open Data Kit, which was a Google project in about 2010 or 11 that got taken over by the University of Washington in Seattle, and. Uh, um, they're designed for social surveys. Uh, I'm going to go out and ask people questions. Um, and they've been extended to handle some geospatial data and to make some recordings. But we took a really hard look. We, at several points, we took a really hard look at social survey software like that and found that it wasn't a real good fit for what field researchers do in the sense of uh, you know, going out and making observations about the natural world or the archaeological record or whatever. Um, I will say since then, like solving for that problem uh, also allows FAMES to handle you know, so I, I mean, we, we can handle social survey uh, things. All right, I would say that that what that's sort of a subset of uh, of of the bigger domain problem. Um, but particularly with the you know, we design for you know for use in remote environments offline. I am not unless you went and and you know installed a Redcap server on. I don't I don't see how you deploy it to a remote area where you need to have, you know, 10 people out totally offline using their own individual mobile devices, uh, collecting things separately and then, you know, coming coming back in. I'm not 
I'm not sure how that would, uh, you know, how that would work in a system like uh, like Redcap, and even ODK. Uh, the last time I checked, they were, pro they were promising things like bi bi-directional synchronization, but didn't have it yet. So I, I, there, you know, so there's some pretty fundamental features that the social software survey doesn't have that field researchers need. The best way to think about it from a technical perspective is the number of spreadsheets you need. So uh, most of these answers that I'm going to be providing right now are taken from my experience with Qualtrics rather than Redcap, so with a grain of salt. But if, if your data collection fits well within a single spreadsheet, you, you don't have multi-valued attributes, you don't have child entities and so on and so forth, then the simplicity of survey software that expects, here's my question, here's my question, here's my question, works very well. And Qualtrics has an offline uh, write-only mode, so you collect data and it eventually goes up to its server. What, what these systems don't do that we focused on is the ability to edit, the ability to view, and the ability to have multiple tables or spreadsheets in a single data collection session. And so we, we solve very different purposes, and FAMES has a complexity cost because we're so general, so that if you do have a survey of what's your age, what's your occupation, then the survey specific tools will fit that need better. But if you have a more nuanced, okay, tell me about your household. Now, tell me about the, the folk in your household and give me their employment history. We have an oral history project that needs to use FAMES because of the complexity of their data collection. And the only other thing I would add to that the, I think the closest analogy of software that I and certainly that we look at when we are thinking about what do we want to do with fames and when we look at business models and other things, I think we are probably closest to lab archives, but well, where they do, you know, laboratory work, we do field work. Uh, and I ha I've had a couple of conversations with the lab archives people, and they just will not touch offline work with a 10-foot pole because they, you know, they really are focused on um, on making sure that uh, ensuring the integrity of all their records in the sense of you know, being able to go back three years and see who discovered the gene target that led to the billion dollar pharmaceutical, you know, to resolve the lawsuit that's happening over that. And and they they feel like they've got to have a full time connection to their servers to to uh, allow that kind of um, auditability and, uh, you know, and um, uh, in be, be able to really uh, guarantee that what was done when, you know, what was done when by whom, um, which we also record, and I think we do it in a reasonably robu robust way, but uh, Lab Archives, uh, the, they've just told me they're not interested in offline stuff. <laughs> so, um, uh, but I'd say that's the closest software to what we do. Thanks. Um, we've got a couple of other questions coming in through here. Is uh, there any way to install on a laptop rather than Android mobile device? I only have an Apple mobile device. So let me answer that one. Uh, we've, we've explored a number of ways of emulating an Android on a laptop. And the, the short version is for FAMES 2.6, no. Um, it, it, it's designed as a native Android system because we have so many interactions with the hardware of the Android. And and one of our hopes for FAMES 3 is, is that now the state of the art has moved on from 2012, we can indeed generalize to arbitrary platform, but with the same sensor capabilities. All right, thank you. Now, uh, next question, would it be possible for those listening in on this session to record their interest in your proposal for the up and coming ARDC platforms, EOI? And if so, where do we register this interest? Yes, please uh, contact uh, contact me if you if you are interested. I've just been uh, emailing our existing uh, you know our, our big existing users and uh, and the 
uh, the investigators and organizations that were on our last leaf, which we put in in 2018. So um, I would be, yes, I would be really happy to uh, to to have other people join, uh, you know, other organizations, other investigators join it. Um, so uh, I think I've provided my email, uh, you know, my email to uh, to you, and I'd be happy to have anyone who's interested contact me. And just to speak about the different levels of interaction, we plan to have this be both a service, a self-hosted service, and something that we can do as consulting. But if you're interested in specific features, especially integration with external hardware like a Bluetooth printer or something that no other software does and you're pretty sure that we won't think of, the best time to get involved is when we're designing and trying to plan the next generation. So, so. There, there's a higher amount of time needed if, if you want technical input, but now is the time to provide that. Oh, on that note, um, I understand that you do have a version which has integrated IGSN, which is the persistent identifier for um, GS samples. Um, are you considering other PIDs as part of the design process? Yes, I think we have. Uh, we've we, we're actually we've worked with uh, Jens Klump and others at uh, the in in at Cyro in Western Australia to uh, figure out different kinds of workflows for uh, you know how do you assign a, a a persistent identifier when you're in the field and you're offline and you're in the field offline for you know two weeks at a time uh, and we've got a couple of workflows for that and uh, I I I think that they would be transferable to other uh, uh, persistent identifiers as well and you know we aim to anything that we do like that any feature that we uh, that we implement we always try to generalize it as much as we can so that it, we solve as many use cases as we you know as, as as we can and I don't see any technical reasons if we can do IGSNs why we can't do others. Right now in FAMES 2.6 all of that identifier minting outside of the allocation of number ranges is handled on export. And so because of that in FAMES 2.6, we the, the, the response is we can handle arbitrary data export to arbitrary uh, handles or identifiers because all we need is a way to speak to the system where we're minting the identifiers in. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, one of the. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'll, I will. Uh, we won't get bogged down in, in more detail than that. Uh, happy to take the, other questions. The previous um, question about um, integrating was asked. Uh, what is your email? Can you please just say what your email address is so that they can get in touch? Oh, sure. Uh, you can uh, reach. Uh, you can reach me at uh, Sean S H A W N dot Ross R O S S at mq.edu.au and hopefully we can ask our organizers to put that into chat and we've also got i'm interested in digital skills and data literacy of fames users has interaction with the tool impacted on users interest in and development of data skills oh i we could talk about this at some length <laughs> so um so uh, we we have a paper about this Okay, so um, yeah, you start, Brian, and then I'll. Yeah, give my so feedback. so this is um, if you're interested, if you're interested in some of the socio-technical aspects and and having students use it and develop it, uh, take a look at Parker van Valkenburg's paper and Adela Sobotkova's paper on uh, both the implementing it outside of Fames. That's Parker's and the socio-technical barriers. Um, most of what we found is, is that people are not that interested in how the tool works, but want to use the tool for their own research. And, and that has shaped many of our interactions and, and consulting models. So, and what I would add to that is, so if you make a tool that, that is customizable, then it requires customization. And what, 
what we found is the biggest you know bear uh, the the biggest barrier to people going out and customizing it on their own uh, isn't necessarily the difficulty of producing and you know the xml code that it takes to to you know set up your uh set up your interface but it's more fundamental uh, lack of uh, training and uh, background in data modeling and workflow modeling, particularly the data modeling that um, you know that uh, when you know people digital systems are far less forgiving than paper that you can. You know, I, I mean, the typical archaeologist may very well write up a paper form on the airplane when he's flying out to, uh, you know, to uh, run a project somewhere. And I, I'm being a little bit facetious, but only no, you're you know, not. Only a little. And uh, you know, uh, you can be if you get a paper form that is, you know, uh, close enough. It then fine. It'll work. In the you know, it, it, it'll work in the field because people just flip the form over and write on the back. The problem with that is then it leaves you with an enormous data cleaning job at the end. So what we do is we really move that up to the front where, you know, we it, uh, digital is much crunchier. It's much less forgiving. You, you really have to specify everything you're going to you collect and it, the details about it and all that. And, um, you know, and it requires the, this data modeling and, and implementation at the beginning. Uh, at you know, but then your payoff is at the end of the season, you hit the export button, and you've got clean, consistent data. So, um, you know, it, it, going through that process of data modeling and to a lesser extent the workflow modeling behind uh, coming up with a user interface is usually a real eye opener to projects and it makes them really think about you know what approach they're using what methods they're using uh how they conduct their field work um uh, you know it, it it often reveals other problems in their you know in their approach or methods um uh, it it can be quite transformative um uh, it when you're forced to uh specify you know all your data that you're collecting at the you know at the beginning um so and then conversely what we found is even if two months of time doing that at the beginning saves two years of time at the end in data cleaning uh which would not those figures would not be out of line for an archaeological a medium-sized archaeological project um it is very difficult to get busy researchers to invest the two months up front to save the two years at the end because everyone is so time pressed and discounts their future time too much so so no that uh, that question opens a lot of socio-technical things that that have been one of the most interesting um side effects of our you know of our project well, thank you. Do we have any last minute questions before um, we wrap up almost on time? No, not at this point. Well, please, if you do have any further questions, you do have Sean's email address or you can put them through to myself. Um, now, uh, quite a number of people are saying thank you very much and how interesting this has, session has been and we very much look forward to seeing what FAMES does in the future. Uh, so one note for the folk interested in more details, Sean's PDF doesn't end where he, he showed you. We have about 20, 30 more slides in that. So if you're interested in more details, I encourage you to look at that PDF and more resources are available therein. All right, splendid. People saying it's fantastic backstory and features of FAMES and look forward to reading more. And the PDF, I'm assuming, is in the GitHub? Yes. It's, On screen. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, we do welcome more you know, for collaborations, uh, the expansion of our collaborations that we have now, uh, that we designed this software to be usable across a range of disciplines anywhere in the world. And we would like, you know, we would like to, uh, uh, to, to work on building our user community. And thank you all for being an yes. audience with fascinating questions. Yes, thanks. <laughs>